Good morning and welcome to the Women of Impact kickoff here in RTP. Welcome to our audience here in the room. Welcome to our audiences on Cisco TV, on our social media platforms, on Facebook, on Twitter, and welcome to Cisco colleagues all around the world. My name is Victoria Ivanovich and I am so excited to welcome you to today and to our kickoff of Women of Impact. For those of you who know about Cisco, March, March is a big month here at Cisco. We look forward to this every year. And this year, we're looking forward to it more because we've got more things for you. March, the whole March month of March, is Women of Impact Month. Before we dive into our events today, I'd just like to take a moment to talk a little bit about inclusion and diversity here at Cisco. Inclusion, diversity, collaboration, and technology are all keys to our success as a company and to us being able to build a better world. At Cisco, we value inclusion and diversity as a bridge to bringing diverse innovation, diverse ideas, and better products to market. We know the importance of having an employee base that matches our customer base. And our customer base is the world. We want our company to look the same way. Specifically, Women of Cisco is an opportunity for us inside Cisco and outside Cisco to attract, develop, retain, and celebrate women in tech. And we take that responsibility seriously, which is why we have the month of Women of Impact. There we go. Women of Impact is actually a month-long celebration this year. In the past, we've done this as a 24-hour follow the sun day, coordinating with International Women's Day. But March is also Women's History Month. And so we have decided this year to extend Women of Impact because we know its importance to a month of events. This is our first week. And the weeks are actually mapped to our four pillars inspire where we challenge you to reach up look for ways to spark your passion take a step outside your comfort zone taking a clear action to get you where you want to go our second week is give back and during that week we challenge you to reach out to the community at large with the heart of a servant and the strength of a leader our third week is develop, and that's really where we're asking you to reach inside. You've all heard the spiel on airplanes, put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on anybody else. This is your week to invest in you. Take that time, build a new skill, make a new connection, grow personally. And our last week is celebrate, and we encourage you during that week to really reach across. Reach across to our Cisco colleagues, reach across to our partners, our customers, students in your community, and the community at large. Celebrate women in tech and women at Cisco. So with that, I am going to introduce our first speaker. And yes, I do need notes for this one because she's got an incredible bio. Um, so I have a couple of questions for you. Do you worry? that people are more successful than you? Does self-doubt keep you stuck? I know for me, that can be a yes. Could you use some help staying motivated to reach your goals? Remember the purpose of this week is to reach up, so staying motivated is part of it. If you answered yes to any of these questions, you're in the right place. Our speaker has spent 15 years studying what it takes to be mentally strong. Her books, 13 things mentally strong people do, don't do, don't not do, don't do, and 13 things mentally strong parents don't do have been translated into 36 languages. She's a regular contributor to Forbes, Inc., and Psychology Today, where her articles on mental strength reach more than 2 million readers each month. Her advice has been featured by media outlets across the globe, 
including MTV, CNN, the Hallmark Channel, Time, Good Morning America, and Today. She gave one of the most popular TEDx talks of all time. If you haven't seen it, look it up. It was very inspiring to me. And today she's going to talk to us about how to give up bad habits that rob women of mental strength. So without any further delay, please help me welcome Amy Morin, a psychotherapist, international best-selling author, and avid listener of True Crime Podcasts. Hey, Amy. Great to have you here. So my first question for you is, is it a sign of mental strength if we coordinate our outfits? This was not planned. <laughs> We got a list of suggestions for what to wear on a broadcast, and we both chose the color. <laughs> Clearly, great minds think alike. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're all really excited to hear what you have to say about mental strength. Your challenge questions to us really intrigued me. So I am going to hand off the time to you and have a seat. Beautiful to begin with, but in every photo, it's almost like a professional photographer must have taken it. There's never a hair out of place. And she and her family go on all these exciting adventures, and she's always taking pictures of it and talking about how grateful she is. She's got a great job, and she drives a cool car, has a beautiful house, so everything seems perfect. How many of you have a friend kind of like that? And how many of you kind of don't like that person sometimes? <laughs> We all do it, right? And it's hard not to do. But that way of thinking keeps us stuck. That's one of the things we're going to talk about today is how our bad habits can keep us stuck in life. Because researchers have found that envying someone on social media is actually directly linked to depression. And that's just one trap that our minds can set for us. Maybe you've complained about your boss. Probably nobody here has, though, right? <laughs> Or maybe you've looked at your friends' lives and you think, oh, how come they have all the luck and I don't? Well, those kinds of bad habits will rob you of the mental strength that you need to be your best. So that's what we're going to talk about today is some of our unhealthy beliefs and the bad habits that keep us from being as strong as we could be. But before we dive too deep into that, we're going to do a little exercise. You can stay right in your seats. Just make sure that you don't hit your neighbor when we do this. Uh, there's three parts to this exercise. So the first part, you're going to just say what I say and then do what I say. So if I say reach up, you say reach up and you reach up. Got it? Reach up. Reach, up. reach down. Reach down. Reach right. Reach, right. reach, left. reach left. Good, you guys got it. Okay, so for the second part of this exercise, you're going to say what I say, but do the opposite of what I say. Reach left. Reach, left. <laughs> Reach right. Reach down. Reach up. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, third and final part. You're going to do what I do, but you're going to say the opposite. Oh. Got it? Reach left. <laughs> Reach right. Reach down. <laughs> this is the part where I start to see hands going every which direction. Point being, it's really hard to make your body do the opposite of what your mind says. So if you walk into a meeting and you think, what I have to say isn't worthwhile, what kind of vibes do you put off? What kind of body language do you have? If you're writing a report and you're thinking, this is terrible, nobody's going to read this, I don't have anything important to say, what kind of work are you going to be producing? Or if you walk into a networking event and you think, oh, I'm so socially awkward, <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? What happens in our minds follows with our body. We react by the way that we think. Your thinking greatly affects your ability to literally and figuratively reach up. So today we're going to talk about some of those unhealthy beliefs that hold us back so we don't reach as high as we could. And how do we get rid of those? How do we get rid of the bad habits that come from that? There's three kinds of unhealthy beliefs that tend to keep us stuck. 
The first one is when we have unhealthy beliefs about ourselves. Sometimes we feel sorry for ourselves. We think, ugh, my life isn't as good as it could be. Everybody else's life is better than mine. Why do I have to go through all this? And to be clear, it's okay to, to be sad. Being sad can help you heal when something bad happens. But what's not healthy is when you start to magnify exactly how bad your problems are and you think that you're helpless, you're hopeless, there's no point in trying. And it's a problem that I see often as a therapist. People will say, okay, I'm ready to change my life. But then they come in week after week and they don't want to actually do anything different. They just want to tell me all the bad things that happened to them in the past seven days. And I have to explain to them that, okay, that's too bad that those things happened to you, but the point is, what are you going to do about it? You have to take some action if you want to actually change your life. Another bad habit is when we give up after the first failure. I once had this man come into my therapy office, and he was in his mid-40s. He was significantly overweight, and it was starting to cause lots of other health problems. He had high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And his doctor said, I keep talking to him about these problems, but he kind of laughs. She said, I don't know if he doesn't get it, or maybe he's hiding some depression. There's something going on with him. He doesn't seem to care. So she sent him to my office so I could see if he had depression, anxiety, something else going on. And sure enough, he comes in and he sits down and he immediately starts making jokes about being pleasantly plump and being overweight. And at first I thought, maybe it's an education issue. I just need to talk to him to figure out if he doesn't understand uh, exactly the seriousness of his issues or what's going on. But at some point he said to me, oh, Amy, I could lose weight if I wanted to. I did it before. I could do it again if I wanted to. So I said, oh, tell me about that then. And he said, well, obviously, he said, I changed my diet. I started exercising and the, the pounds came off. And then I'd go out in the grocery store. I'd be somewhere out in the community and people would come up to me and they'd say, you look great. And he's like, and it was like they were proud of me. But after a few months, I stopped losing weight. And a few months after that, I started gaining it back. And I'd run into those same people out in the community and they looked at me a little bit different. It was like they were disappointed in me. And he said, I don't ever want to feel like that again. I'd rather that people think I'm overweight than people think I'm a failure. At least if you fail at something in your private life, like your financial life, or maybe you fail at something at work, not everybody knows. He said, but when you fail at this, everybody sees it. I don't ever want to feel like that again. And it became clear that my work with him was about helping him overcome his fear of failure because until he was willing to try, there was going to be no hope for him. He had to know, okay, there's no guarantee that this is going to turn out well, but you can try to do it anyway. The second type of unhealthy belief that keeps us stuck is when we have unhealthy beliefs about other people. Because sometimes we think other people can control us and we give them too much power over our lives. Maybe you say your mother-in-law drives you crazy. Maybe she's not the nicest human being on the planet, but it's not up to her to dictate how you feel. That's up to you. Or maybe you say, my boss makes me work late. Yeah, there's consequences maybe if you didn't work longer hours, but it's still a choice. And sometimes just reframing your language and recognizing that it's up to you to decide what kind of life you want to have empowers you to reach up. Or maybe you're one of us people pleasers. We try to make everybody else feel happy. I once worked with this woman and she said, I guess I'm going to quit my job. I wasn't cut out for this. And she was about ready to, to give in her resignation that week. And I said, well, tell me what's going on. And she said, well, for 10 years, I've done everything my boss has asked. When somebody says jump, I say how high but I keep watching everybody around me get promoted. I'm sick of this. Clearly my boss doesn't think I was meant to be a leader. So I said, well, if you're gonna quit anyway, you might as well go ask your boss why you don't get promoted. And so she agreed reluctantly, but she said, fine, I guess I'm not out anything. And so she did, and she came back the following week and she said, I can't believe it. She said, for 10 years, I thought I was making my boss happy by doing everything he said, but when I asked him why I didn't get promoted, you know what he said? I can't promote somebody that doesn't have a backbone. How do I make you a leader if you can't say no to anybody? She said, it never occurred to me that by being a, a people pleaser that I was actually doing the opposite. I was showing him that I couldn't say no to anyone, and therefore I couldn't be an effective leader. There's an interesting study that found that people pleasers lack willpower. When you go around saying yes to everybody all day long, you don't have anything left over for yourself. 
So, if you're a people pleaser, you're likely to struggle with reaching your own goals because you're so busy running around making everybody else happy, there's nothing left over for you. And that will definitely drain you of your mental strength. The third type of unhealthy belief is when we have unhealthy beliefs about the world in general. Maybe you shy away from change. I worked with this other woman who, her world was sort of crumbling around her. She, her job, she'd gotten, uh, she was a waitress at a restaurant. She used to work on the evening shift, but they put her on the, the lunch shift, which meant she didn't make as much money anymore. And because of that, she was struggling to pay her bills, including her mortgage. Her house was about to go into foreclosure. She was in an unhealthy relationship, and she'd been in that relationship for a long time. And she came into my office because she said, I'm struggling with anxiety. And so we talked about the things that were going on. And I said, well, what are you going to do about all these problems that you have? And she said, well, right now I'm just calling everybody I know. If I can just borrow $10 from somebody, $20 from somebody else, maybe I can pay the mortgage this month. I said, yeah, well, then what are you going to do after that? And she said, I don't know. I'm just going to keep seeing what I can do to, to scramble to make things happen. What about getting a new job? She said, no, no, I like the people I work with. I don't want to do anything different. What if you move? What if you get a new place to live? She said, no, no, I've lived here a long time. I love it. What about your relationship? Nope, I've invested 10 years. I'm not going to give up now. And it was clear that her world was literally crumbling and she was fighting and clawing to keep everything the same. No wonder she had anxiety. So I pointed that out to her and I said, you know, it looks like everything around you is changing and you're kind of staying stuck. And she said, yeah, absolutely. She said, things are really bad right now, but at least they're predictable. And I thought, how many times do we do that in our own lives where we think, you know, things are bad, but I don't want to make anything worse, so I'm not going to do anything different. And we stay stuck. So another bad habit is when we fear taking a calculated risk. Take public speaking, for example. It's not the riskiest thing in the world, yet most of us find it to be really scary. I used to be one of those people. So we tend to think that our level of fear is pretty equal to the level of risk. If it feels scary, it must be risky. So when you stop and you think about it, well, the risk I took today was taking an Uber to get here, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's very little risk involved in standing up here in front of you. I don't think anybody's going to rush the stage and beat me to death with their shoe. But at the same time, I took a car ride and had no fear of it. But we do this all the time. We tend to think if something feels scary, it must be risky, so we talk ourselves out of doing it. Anxiety is funny like that. But the truth is, your level of fear has nothing to do with the actual level of risk. The universe just doesn't work like that. So it's hard. It's hard to change those unhealthy beliefs. It's hard to get rid of our bad habits. But you can't afford not to change them. I guarantee there'll come a moment in your life where you need every ounce of mental strength that you can muster. I was at that point in my own life when I wrote a list called 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. I started out as a therapist thinking my, my goal in life was to teach other people how to be mentally strong based on what I'd learned from textbooks in college. But when my mother died suddenly from a brain aneurysm, it struck me that my interest in mental strength was also personal. I wanted to know, why did some people come into my therapy office and even if they'd been through tough times, they were able to turn their struggles into some sort of strength and they went on and became better than before? But I saw plenty of other people that went through tough times sort of became reduced by it. They stayed stuck. They were bitter. They were angry. They weren't able to move forward. They felt like their life could never be good again. So I said, I want to know what, what makes these people tick. How come they have such incredible mental strength? And pretty early on, I realized it wasn't about what people did. Sometimes it was more about what they didn't do. People who didn't have certain bad habits were able to thrive. When they faced challenges, they could overcome them, they could work through them, and they became stronger because of it. And I'm glad that I started learning those lessons early on because on the three-year anniversary of the day that my mother died, my 26-year-old husband died of a heart attack. I found myself a widow at the age of 26, and I didn't have my mom. And I thought, ugh, I'm supposed to be a therapist who helps other people deal with their problems. How do I do this? And I knew, okay, if I do nothing else, just don't do these certain bad habits, and somehow maybe you'll come out on the other side and be okay. Another lesson I had learned, too, was that whomever said time heals everything lied 
Time heals nothing. It is what you do with your time that matters. So he said, I'm going to put every ounce of energy into healing my broken heart and figuring out how do I feel better. But it still took a long time. It was years. But a few years down the road, I was fortunate enough to find love again. I got remarried, got a new house, got a new job, and I thought, ooh, this is my chapter two. Life is going to be good. And almost as quickly as that happened, my father-in-law got diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I thought, oh, I can't do this. I've grieved for so long, I can't grieve any longer. My heart is just too broken. But it wasn't like I had a choice. But unlike when I'd lost my mother and my husband, this time I knew what was coming. I knew we had maybe a couple of months left with my father-in-law on the planet. And I thought, I don't know if I can go through this again. And in those moments, I reminded myself it wasn't about what I did. It was about what I didn't do. And digging in my heels and hosting a pity party wasn't going to do me or anyone else any good. So I sat down and I wrote down the list of what mentally strong people don't do. When I was done, I had a list of 13 things. And I would read over that list as often as I could and say, OK, no matter what you do today, just don't do these certain things and maybe you'll be OK. And I found it to be helpful. So I thought, well, if this helps me, maybe it will help somebody else. So sort of on a whim, I published it online and I stepped away from my computer, hoping a few people would read the list. 50 million people read that list. <laughs> And it changed the entire course of my life. Thank you. And the most important lesson I learned through all of it was that it just takes one counterproductive bad habit to keep you stuck in life. And mental strength is a lot like physical strength. If you wanted to become physically strong, you'd go to the gym. But hopefully, if you worked with a trainer, they'd also say, quit eating so many jelly donuts, right? If you wanted to see some progress. Mental strength's like that, too. You need good habits. You need to practice gratitude. You need to take care of yourself. But you also have to say, do I have any bad, unhealthy habits that are keeping me back? And when you get rid of those things, all of your good habits become much more effective. And I don't know about you, but I like to work smarter, not just harder. <laughs> so I like to get rid of the counterproductive things that are holding me back and keeping me stuck. So, how do you train your brain to think differently? Well, it starts by countering some of those unhealthy beliefs that we talked about. So unhealthy beliefs about yourself, those usually come about because we're uncomfortable with our feelings. Being sad and hurt and angry, disappointed, those things are all uncomfortable. So in our attempt to avoid feeling uncomfortable, we do things like host a pity party. Or we tend to do things where we think we just won't fail because failing feels bad. We do anything we can to not feel bad. In the end, it comes back to bite us. Unhealthy beliefs about other people, those usually come about because we compare ourselves. We think other people are either above us or below us, or we blame them for holding us back. But really, we're not in competition with anybody. And studies will show if you look at other people as opinion holders rather than your competitors, then you actually learn from them. Rather than growing resentful or bitter or angry if somebody's doing better, you can keep your eyes on your own course and then not get distracted by what people around you are doing. And unhealthy beliefs about the world, those come about because we tend to want the world to be fair. We think if I put in enough hard work, if I do enough good deeds, it'll come back to me, maybe even tenfold. But the truth is, life isn't always fair. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, and that's not to discourage you from doing good things in life, but it does mean that no matter how much you've suffered in life, that you're not necessarily doomed to keep suffering, that your world can be what you make it. In a couple minutes, I'm going to open it up to questions where you can ask me anything you want about mental strength. But before I do, I'll tell you a little story about somebody who came into my therapy office. He, his doctor had referred him because he had diabetes. And he wasn't taking care of himself at all. His blood sugar was through the roof all the time, to the point that he'd started to lose his eyesight. And because he was losing his eyesight, he could no longer drive a car. And this is in rural Maine, where when you can't drive a car, your world gets really small really fast. We don't have things like public transportation. And so he came into my office, and I was trying to figure out what's going on with him. His doctor said, he might be depressed. I don't know. Or she said, or maybe he just doesn't understand. So I started talking to him about it, and it became clear that he just sort of thought this was his lot in life. His mother had died from complications of diabetes when she was fairly young, so he thought, what's the point? It's going to happen to me, too. 
So he didn't put in any effort into taking care of himself or managing his blood sugar. So I said, well, if there's no point in it anyway, you're not out anything if you just try an experiment, just for a week. This is a guy that was drinking two liters of Pepsi a day. And so I convinced him, let's just swap that out for Diet Pepsi for the week. Just see what happens. And he came back the next week and he said, okay, I have to tell you two things. Number one, Diet Pepsi tastes terrible. <laughs> but number two, I can't believe how much my numbers changed. He was starting to see it, just a little bit of improvement. So I said, that's great. Let's see if we can try another experiment this week. We started looking at some of his other habits. This was a guy that never looked at nutrition labels. He had no idea what he was consuming most of the time and loved to eat ice cream, chips, that sort of a thing. So we started looking at other stuff we could cut out or swaps we could make just to see what would happen. And he would come back the next week and he'd give me a full report on what he was noticing. And then one week he was out shopping with a friend at a thrift store and he finds this beat up old exercise bike and he decides to buy it. He parks it in his living room and he pedals. So instead of sitting on the couch and eating snacks, he's pedaling his exercise bike slowly. And he comes in one week and he said, you're never going to believe this. I can see the TV just a little bit more clearly than I could before. And suddenly it occurred to him that the damage that had been done to his eyesight wasn't permanent. And he started to think, okay, maybe I do have some control over this. And from that week forward, he was on fire. He would start coming into my office and he'd say, okay, what are we going to do this week? And he was finally excited about changing his life. But it all started with one small step, which was the Pepsi incident. <laughs> but for him to realize, okay, I can, I can choose to change my life. I can make a better life for myself if I just take one small step, give up some of the bad habits that are keeping me stuck, and adopt some better, healthier habits and help myself move forward. So I challenge you today to think about what's one bad habit that you could give up? What's something in your life that keeps you from being able to reach up as high as you could? I guarantee we all have them, but when you cut that out, all of your other good habits will become much more effective. And you can achieve things you probably never thought possible. So let's go ahead and open it up to any questions that you have about mental strength. Yeah, so um, what we'd like you to do is um, if you will come up to the center microphone, we'll, uh, right here, we'll uh, take some questions and while you're putting your questions together, I'm gonna ask Amy a couple. Um, so the first one is, you know, with a lot of things when we talk about changing, there's this whole fake it till you make it kind of approach. So as I'm sitting here, I'm like, okay, well, I can just fake being tough and maybe I'll get there. What do you think? So there is a lot of research that shows that uh, it can be beneficial to act like the person you wanna become. So let's say you wanna have more confidence act like a more confident person. If you change your behavior first, the feelings often come later. But sometimes we make a mistake. We think, uh, I'm gonna act like somebody that I'm not. I'm gonna do something completely out of my character. It's not about being fake. It's about saying, how do I become the best version of myself? But when you say the word tough too, it just reminds me that a lot of people confuse what it means to be strong with acting tough. Being strong is about acknowledging your emotions, accepting that you have some weaknesses, being able to talk about things, being able to ask for help. People who act tough pretend like nothing bothers them, that pain isn't an issue, that they can accomplish anything at all times, but it actually takes a lot more strength to say, no, I need help, or I'm not good at everything I do, or here are some of my weaknesses, or to think about how much courage it takes to say to somebody, I feel really sad. <laughs> it takes a lot more courage to do that than to say, no, nothing ever bothers me. I love that. So um, I was also thinking about, as you went through your presentation today, you talked a lot about mental health components. So is there a direct mental health relationship to being mentally strong? So a lot of people will think that if you have depression or anxiety, that it's a weakness. So say, I'm not mentally strong. That's not the case either. Mental strength's a lot like physical strength again. So maybe you have a physical health problem say diabetes, since we just talked about that one, but you could still go to the gym and, and lift weights and become physically strong if you wanted to. Mental strength's the same. You might have a mental health problem like depression or anxiety, 
but you can still make choices every day to become mentally stronger. And so some of the strongest people I've ever met were battling some sort of mental health issue like depression or anxiety. Okay, perfect. Do we have any questions from the audience? Dave, you'll just come up to the microphone. And it's a pleasure to meet you, uh, David Richards. So it's, it's funny because I just, um, I'm not trying to promote anything that I'm doing, but uh, I'm doing a crowdfunding campaign for a book contest for my next book. And um, your book was one of the inspirations that I actually wrote in my campaign letter to send out to people. So it's, oh, it's kind of surreptitious and, and beautiful to, to be here with you. You talked about um, physical health and like if you're working with a trainer, you say, well, lay off the jelly donuts. What are your thoughts on mental nutrition? In other words, especially in this day and age where we have so much there's social media and there's just we're inundated, how do you stay, and I think it's a habit, but how do you stay or create healthy mental habits around what you consume mentally? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so it's really about, you know, if we look at the age of social media and the things that we consume, the stuff that we're bombarded with, I think it's so important. You can use media to become mentally stronger, but it can also drain you of your mental strength. So I love to read studies on sort of what's going on with us with our social media and our smartphone habits. And simple things you can do to set limits. Sleeping with your cell phone in your room tends to decrease your happiness and increase your anxiety. So just putting it in a different room when you go to bed at night is one simple but easy thing that you could do. Also, if you look at your social media accounts, who do you follow? Who do you unfollow? Who do you mute? Especially in a heated political season, it's okay to mute people. <laughs> Family and friends, you can unfollow people. Uh, and that's not to say you need to get rid of everybody you disagree with, but just check in with yourself. How does this affect my mental health? How do I feel when I'm scrolling through social media? Uh, and studies will show too, you know, it only takes about 10 minutes of social media consumption before we tend to start to feel bad about ourselves because it looks like everybody else's life is happier and healthier. And so it's important to check in with yourself about that and to just become more aware of your habits. I work with a lot of people in my office who will say, I don't spend much time on social media, but we'll get an app that tracks it. And they'll say, well, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Well, it really adds up over the course of the day. So I think it's important to just be hyper aware of what you're consuming and to set limits, use technology to your advantage uh, so that you aren't just bombarded with bad news all day long. Okay, any other questions? Carly, if you'll go to the microphone. It needs to talk to eat with us. I haven't read the book, but I will. Sure. So some of the other things I talked about today, like not feeling sorry for yourself or not giving away your power. Let's see. One that I did talk about might be a couple. Of, let's see. Oh, a big one is not to dwell on the past. Mm -hmm. Ooh, um, that's hard. It is. <laughs> and if there's somebody in here, somebody that just rehashes conversations in your head over and over, things that happened last week. Or maybe there's somebody that you know you got hurt 10 years ago by somebody and you just can't let it go. Uh, it's so important to figure out how do you learn from the past, how do you reflect on it, but how do you not get stuck there? Uh, because I see so many people who will think that either a bad childhood or a rough patch in life or a mistake that they made somehow makes it that their life can't be good enough. And so sometimes we need help. You need professional help to work through issues. Sometimes it's about just being conscious of how much you think about the past, um, how much effort you put into rehashing a conversation that didn't go well, and just being more proactive about being mindful so that you can enjoy the moment and plan for the future. And she's a shame researcher. And I never thought of myself as having shame, but then when I read her book, I was like, and there I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I realized that some of my reactions at work, when someone asks me a basic question, immediately I get really defensive. And I think that's my shame. Like, why didn't you know that already? Why didn't you already cover that already? So I'm trying to retrain myself to not immediately do that. So do you have any tips for those of us who are the people pleasers or the shame um, people who immediately beat yourself up instead of taking that moment to reframe? Absolutely. And I think it's a, an issue a lot of us do and we don't necessarily realize that we do it. So if you have a reaction, whether you're a yes person who always says yes to everything or you're somebody that gets defensive, 
It's just about noticing it, first of all. Giving yourself a moment. So you say, I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to count to five. And studies will show if you just put a label on your emotion, number one, it takes a lot of the sting out of it, but it also then helps you respond in a healthy way. So whether you notice that you're embarrassed, you're disappointed, you're angry, you're upset, if you took a minute to just label it, name your feeling for just a second, it can then help you respond in a healthier way. The interesting thing is sometimes I'll do this exercise with people is I'll say, I'll give you 30 seconds. Write down as many feeling words as you can. People get out their pen and their piece of paper, or they take out their phone and they start texting as if they're going to get a million words in 30 seconds. We find most adults can name about five feeling words. We get to about happy, sad, mad, and then we sort of get stuck after that. Uh, so because it's not something that we do, we're not used to talking about feelings. And that's not to say you need to walk around and announce how you're feeling to everybody that you meet throughout the day. But sometimes it's just about acknowledging it to yourself. How do I feel right now? And once you do that, then you can make a healthier decision on how to move forward. So I'd say take a deep breath, give yourself five seconds before you respond, see if you can name your emotion and then decide how, what's the healthiest way. And then maybe at the end of the day to just check in with yourself. How did I do today? Is there anything I could do better for tomorrow? And I think just doing those things makes it so it won't be such a natural reaction. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm hearing all of these fantastic ideas. I have my question is how do you overcome the fear in doing that? You know, because a lot of us we want to do things in our mind and our head. We say, yeah, we're going to do it, but then when we get to the point of doing it, it's where that self doubt or you start to overthink it. And so I'm there right now, person, right now. And but at the same time, I want I want to kind of go over that hurdle and. How did you do it? What are some tips you can share with us? So a few things can help with that. Obviously, when it comes to facing fears, you want to do it one small step at a time. Sometimes we think we'll take a giant leap and then we terrify ourselves and we talk ourselves out of doing anything scary again. But if you can start with a small step, what's a little bit scary? And then once you do that, it becomes not so scary anymore and you take one more little step. Uh, as far as self-doubt is concerned, it's about then talking back to your self-doubt. So sometimes you can argue the opposite. When in your head you're thinking, oh, here are 10 reasons why I shouldn't do this or 100 reasons why it's not going to work out, just argue the complete opposite and it'll help you develop a more balanced outlook. Or ask yourself, what would I say to a friend who had this problem? We tend to be so much kinder and more compassionate to other people. So if you had a friend who said, oh, I was thinking about applying for this, but I don't know, I think I probably won't get it. You probably wouldn't be like, yeah, you idiot, you're not going to succeed. <laughs> But we tend to say that to ourselves. So if you say, well, what would I say to my friend? I'd probably have some kind, compassionate words of, no, you can do this, and here are three reasons why, or even if it doesn't work out, you'll be okay anyway. And you just start giving yourself the exact same advice that you'd give to somebody else. And studies will show self-compassion is the key to performing at our best. So we tend to think that harsh self-criticism works, so we call ourselves names or beat ourselves up, but it doesn't. So I think it's all about saying, how do you talk to yourself differently? Speak to yourself with compassion. Give yourself a pep talk when you need it. And know that you don't have to wait until you have zero fears to know that, okay, I can face my fears and I'll be okay anyway. And sometimes it's about reminding yourself of all the reasons why you'll be okay even if it doesn't work out exactly the way that you wanted. And one more trick for you too is to write it down. So if you are thinking, should I take this leap or not? Write down, here are the pros and cons of not doing it, and then write down the pros and cons of doing it. And there's something about seeing it on paper that can sometimes then give you the courage to take the leap when you aren't 100% sure. But there's also a study. So for people who are afraid of change, they did this study where they asked people, they found people who were sort of ambivalent about a big change in their life, whether it was making a move, a job change, or even ending a relationship. And they said, uh, what if we leave it up to a coin toss? And all of these people agreed, sure, I'll leave it up to a coin toss. So heads, you make the leap, tails, you don't. So that's what they did. People who got heads made the change. People who got tails didn't. And then they followed up with them three months later. Almost all the people who'd made the change were much happier. So then they followed up with them six months later, and their happiness had skyrocketed in comparison to the people who didn't make the change. So when you need a push, keep that one in mind that sometimes, although change is scary and we worry about it, sometimes it's really good for our mood and our happiness level. Any other questions from the room? 
Well, one came up for me as we were sitting here. Um, the theme, the message for our week for all of the women at Cisco and, and our audience is um, a challenge to reach up, to aspire to do something It's a little bit out of your comfort zone, take that first step. So I know you talked about a lot of steps today, but can you give us an Amy challenge? So I think if you were to come up with hmm, a list of things, like sort of crazy wild things, if you could imagine that you woke up tomorrow and life were better, what would you see? What would you be doing differently? So maybe that would be I'd be happier. Well, what would you, you'd feel happier, but what would you be doing? Would you be going out more? Would you call more friends? Would you... Uh, walk into work with a little more pep in your step. What would you be doing tomorrow if you woke up and your life were better? Take a second and just answer that question in your head. And then my challenge to you is do some of those things tomorrow. So often we do the opposite. We think, okay, if I wait until my life is better, then I'll start working out and I'll go to the gym. Or if I wait until my life is better, then I'll spend more time with my friends. But sometimes the best way to improve your life is to just start doing those things now. Go spend more time with friends. Spend more time with your family. Do fun things. Um, hit the gym now and see what happens later. So just figure out what's one thing I could start doing to make my life happier and then just go do it. I love that. I love that. Any more questions from our audience? Melissa Bruder, thank you for being here. In, in thinking through that, I, one of the things that came top of mind for me is creating boundaries. And I feel like in some of what you were saying earlier, that's part of it. So can you talk through maybe a time in your life where you've created a boundary that had a positive effect and maybe where it didn't and how you worked through those? So. Oh, great question. So... Yeah, I guess when I know I'm not doing a good job setting boundaries is when I start to get resentful of people because I think that they're wasting my time. Well, it's my time. It's up to me to say, no, this isn't helpful. And of course, I don't want to be rude. I want to be a polite person. And so I become a captive audience easily for people if I'm not careful. And as a therapist, I find, you know, I have to set boundaries with people who just want to call an acquaintance, a friend of a friend. It's, well, I have this problem. Well, I'm not their therapist, and so I have to explain that. Uh, so I think for me that's my big uh, sign is to know when I start to get resentful that people are wasting my time or my energy uh, and I'm getting frustrated and angry, then it means I need to set better boundaries. It's not that other people need to change. It's that I need to set limits. And an example of a time when I did set a boundary that I found helpful, it was tough to do, but overall made, made life better. I had a friend that used to call to tell me about all the bad things that happened in his life. And I wouldn't hear from him again until something else bad happened. And it was a phone call where he would call and he'd like, listen to this. And sometimes he'd ask for my advice and I'd give it to him, but he never followed it. And it really had no interest in doing anything different, just had a sort of a poor me attitude. And so then I started dreading his phone calls and I didn't take his calls for a while. And the more I didn't take his calls, the more he called or texted me. <laughs> And so I had to come to that conclusion that I wasn't being a very good friend to him if all I did was become a captive audience or attend his pity parties. And so it was an awkward and tough conversation to have at the time, but overall it made our friendship much better. I had to say, I don't think I'm being a very good friend to you by just listening to all of your problems. I think if you want some advice, you want some support, I can do that. But if you just call to complain to me about how horrible your life is and you want me to join in, I don't think I can do that anymore. And for him, it seemed to be a wake-up call. Now he calls me with good news. Now we can have conversations, and our friendship is much better overall. And now, even if he has a problem, he'll say, hey, I have this issue. Is it okay to talk about? And I'll say, yes, absolutely. If you want to talk about it, I'm, I can lend an ear. I can be here for emotional support, but I just don't want to be a daily captive audience for uh, hearing about all the problems and why your life is so unfair, if you don't want to take any action. Um, and so there's been other times in my life, too, when it comes to saying no to people who you know, ask for too many favors or people who uh, want to borrow things and they are the people that don't return them, those sorts of things. But I think for a lot of us, you kind of, you know, when somebody's using you, you have that gut feeling, uh, that idea that somebody just wants something from you. And 
aren't necessarily interested in a genuine friendship. And when you have that gut feeling, it's important to listen to it and set boundaries. Uh, and if you've made the mistake of not setting boundaries early on, it's tougher to do later, but, but that you can still draw the line in the sand and that it doesn't mean that you're rude or that you're mean or you're an unkind person, but it means that you respect yourself and you're teaching other people to have respect for you too. So, I'll give an example. A couple of weeks ago, I was feeling really stuck in my career, and then in my mind of trying to figure out what can I do to kind of dig myself out of this, I had all sorts of thoughts. Like, I can go ahead and I can ch I can change my job. I can change a company. I can go ahead and go on sabbatical for six months because nothing's going to change anyway in six months anyway. So why bother being here for it? Um, <laughs> I can cut my hair. That was the most crazy thing. <laughs> When you have all those different thoughts and you find yourself stuck, what advice would you give to people to help them try to narrow down that crazy list and be able to prioritize on what's going to have the biggest impact and actually even just to help you feel like you really are making that first bit of progress so that you can get that little bit of that instant gratification and be able to dig yourself out? Great question. Yeah, sometimes there's so many things and we don't know where to start and just seeing a little bit of progress can help you. Uh, has a snowball effect once it starts to, to build, then you get momentum and you can keep moving forward. So I think, uh, I think there's two parts to your question, kind of when you don't even know where to start because there's so many things going on. Maybe you make a list. Again, I'm a big fan of saying, let's see things on paper um, and just looking at it can help you make a little more sense of it. And then talking about it to somebody else. If you have somebody who you can run this issue through and say, I have all this stuff going on, what do you think? Or can you help me? prioritize things sometimes that can help and I guess going back to what would you say to a friend who said ah, I have all this stuff to I could change what would I do what how can I get there and then say well what advice would I give to somebody else and how do I give that to myself so I think that um, would be the first part of your question and then how do you see some progress I think it's really important to when we have a big goal like oh, I want to change my life how do you know that you're doing it is to come up with those short-term objectives and to know well what's one thing I could do today What's one thing I can do this week? And to start trying to track that. But to be aware that sometimes things get a little bit worse before they get better. And that's the thing I see in my therapy office a lot. When we start talking about really tough things, you might start to feel a little bit worse before you start to feel better. Or when I work with parents who want to address their kids' temper tantrums, they'll say, what do I do? He throws himself to the floor and he's crying and screaming. And I'll say, ignore it. Just look the other way. And the parents will come back the next week and they'll say, that didn't work. He screamed louder. And I'll have to say, well, that means it is working. He's trying to get your attention and it's not working. So his behavior seems like it's getting worse, but I guarantee it'll get better if you stick with it. So to come up with a way, how do you know if something's working? How do you know if it's on track? How do you uh, take a look at it? And I'm, I think anything where you can write it down and because when things change slowly, we don't always notice. So sometimes I work with people and I'll just say, let's rate your mood today from one to 10. And then we'll keep a calendar where we mark down what your moods are. And they'll notice after a few weeks it got better. But if we hadn't started writing it down, they wouldn't notice it. And sometimes just figuring out how do you hold yourself accountable. They did another study where they had people who said, I really want to go to the gym, but I don't go as often as I think I should. So they had half the group keep a calendar and they said, mark an X on the calendar on the days you go to the gym. And they didn't do anything to the other group. Well, guess what happened? The people that put an X on the calendar went to the gym five times a week. The other people didn't change their behavior. And that's all they gave them for instructions. So sometimes it's just a matter of checking in with yourself every day. What's one thing I did today? What's one more thing I can do tomorrow? And as long as we feel like we're taking action, that can help build momentum and keep us going. What stays in motion stays in motion. So if you can just push yourself to, to go do something, uh, it becomes much easier to keep it going. probably have time for one question more, maybe two. Yeah. Hi, Amy. Hello. It was a very good talk. Um, if I have to establish a plan to grow mentally stronger, um, how, what, what should it be? What should be my plan? Great question, too. So if you want to become mentally stronger, just to figure out what are, how do you think, feel, and behave differently? There's three parts to mental strength. So when it comes to the way that you think, it's about recognizing your 
thoughts that aren't helpful. Whether you beat yourself up, you talk yourself out of doing things, your self-doubt convinces you that you're not good enough, to just pay more attention to your thinking patterns and then come up with a plan to, say, argue the opposite. I'm going to start speaking to myself like a friend. I'm going to talk to myself in a way that is more productive. Or if you're somebody that always dwells on the negative, you just start saying, well, what's the other extreme and then you come up with a more rational thing in the middle it's not about being overly positive sometimes people think it's just about positive thinking but no you don't want to walk into a situation thinking i'm going to nail this and then you don't plan for it or study at all you want to make sure that you're prepared so that's the cognitive component the emotional component it's not about being happy all the time but it's about knowing that you can tolerate feeling uncomfortable and knowing that it's okay to be sad, it's okay to be angry, but that you don't have to be stuck there, that you have some control over how long you feel an emotion, that you have some healthy coping strategies, whether you exercise, whether you call a friend, whether you write in a journal, you meditate, that you know, okay, when I am have a bad day, here are my options. When I'm anxious, I can tolerate some anxiety, but I can also do some deep breathing, say, to calm myself down. And then our behavior is the third part. So then it's about how do you face your fears? How do you take steps? How do you do things that are uncomfortable? Maybe it's introducing yourself to three new people. Maybe it's volunteering for a project that you wouldn't normally do. It's doing one, one thing outside your comfort zone and you keep doing it. And when you keep doing those three things every day, if you said, how do I manage my thoughts, my emotions, and my behavior, you will become much more mentally strong over time. It's a lot like physical strength that you need exercise you need to keep focusing on it there's always room for improvement but if you slack on it for too long your mental muscles get weak too okay we have time for one more question if we've got any more in the audience okay yep i know in your therapy office you probably hear problems all day long how do you separate yourself from that and not take it home with you? Another great question. <laughs> Yeah, it's something that you know, all therapists work on, uh, having a good self-care plan and knowing how do, you, how do you take care of yourself if you're surrounded by bad news all day long, what do you do? And so we look for the good. We celebrate small wins when a kid says, hey, I, I passed a test today. Even if you got a D, great job. <laughs> or somebody who says, you know, my, my depression seems a little bit better. So we have those moments and we focus on, on as many of the good things as we can. And to know that uh, even though we hear a lot of the bad stuff, that there's a lot of good stuff in the world too. So we practice our own mental strength with thinking about at the end of the day, do you dwell on all the bad or do you focus on the good? And how do we manage our own emotions? Because we go through emotional roller coasters too uh, throughout the day as everybody's revealing what's going on with them. And then our behavior, it's about saying, how do I take care of myself? Whether it's uh, the commute home or it's about saying I'm going to, the minute I walk in the door, I change my clothes into something else so I can physically feel like I'm in a different universe than I was while I was at my office. And then making sure that you do plenty of fun stuff. If you have a stressful job, as I imagine a lot of you do, you better have a lot of fun in your life too to balance it out. Okay. Well, if you will join me in thanking Amy for being here with us. I think we all have a lot to work on. Yeah, I know I do. I was making my list as the time was going forward. And um, Amy, just in closing, um, as you went through all of the things that you went through and really started to get this context around being mentally strong, if you look back at that time and you look at where you are now, what do you see in yourself? I think the most important thing is that I was way stronger than I thought I was. I was the kid who never spoke in school. So if somebody would have said, hey, someday you're going to get on a stage and speak in front of people, I would have said absolutely not. Uh, and to know that, you know, if somebody would have said, hey, by the way, you're going to go through these things, 
I wouldn't have believed it. I wouldn't have believed I could. I was the kid with separation anxiety who didn't leave my mother's side until I was about 12. So if somebody would have told me that too, uh, I wouldn't have believed in a moment that I could go through those things. So, and I think it's true for all of us that we're way more competent and capable than we give ourselves credit for and that you can do way more than you think you can. And you just have to train your brain to think differently. And when you start doing things that you thought you couldn't do, it literally changes your brain chemistry and your brain will start to be like, hey, this person's way better than I thought they were. And so for me, that's been the biggest lesson is just knowing that I was stronger than I thought that I was. I can do more than I gave myself credit for. And if I just keep going, I can probably accomplish more than I even imagine at this point. Great. Well, thank you again. I'm looking forward to taking my brain to the gym. I think it's time. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here uh, through our network, through our Cisco TV network, through our social networks. Uh, stay engaged with us throughout the month. Don't forget, we are on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. And we're on LinkedIn. So find your favorite social media channel. Stay in touch with us. We are going to have another broadcast that will start at the top of the hour. But again, please join me in thanking Amy Morin for this great time together. And we look forward to being back with you in a few minutes. real news. So let's talk about what we're going to launch today. Here we go. All of you have made some pretty amazing things possible over the years. We got WebEx, we got TP, we can do it wherever we like.